um, uh, this, uh, as you can see, this uh, uh, lecture is uh, made available via Zoom. So I would like to ask every uh, participant to kindly mute their uh, microphones right now. Uh, you can unmute them during the uh, during the, uh, the discussion, which will follow after the talk. Uh, also, this lecture is going to be uh, recorded and later made available for public, uh, for general public, uh, probably via faculty YouTube channel. Right, so I think that uh, these are my technical notes. And now I'm going to uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, who is going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes. Um, uh, our today's speaker is Dr. Giacomo Savani from University of St. Andrews School of Classics. He is a Royal Society of Edinburgh Saltire Ely Carrier Fellow. Uh, he is interested in Roman social and cultural history in ancient environments and the reception of antiquity in early modern Europe, uh, with particular focus on ancient bath, baths and balneology uh, and their reception in Renaissance Italy and 18th century England. Uh, he has a book forthcoming uh, called Rural Bath in Roman Britain, a colonization of the census which is going to be published next year in Routledge. And uh, one thing I really like about his series is that he also focuses on community engagement and bringing archeology span and classics to new audiences. Uh, so I think that that's all from me. And uh, now, uh, Dr. Savani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sushi. So yeah. Yes. So first, let's turn the. Okay. Tomasz, can you confirm that you can see the presentation, please? Okay. So I think you can stop. Excellent. Well, Kara, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you very much to you and Tomasz for inviting me and the Institute and everybody here in the room and online for being here today. So it's really, really a pleasure and an honor to, to be here. So, this paper will look, uh, well, no, no, <laughs> good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's try again. Okay, it seems to be working now, sorry. So the paper that I'm going to present today, will look at the role of images and uh, in the reception of Roman bath in early modern Europe. These buildings were among the most visible and iconic reminders of the classical world in Renaissance Italy, and their rare discoveries spark the imagination of artists, architects, and antiquarians. A medical concern for classical balneology matched a curiosity for the physical remains of thermae and bath. So far, only specific aspects of such a diverse cultural system have received scholarly attention, and these different strands have not yet been integrated into a sustained study. The study, this, this paper contributes to fill this gap using as a case study, a woodcut depicting a cutaway view of a set of bath so far neglected by the scholarship. Based on Vitruvius' description of bath, it was first published in a mid 16th century treatise on balneology. This image reappeared as a copy of a Roman wall painting in several 18th century and, 18th and 19th century 
architectural and antiquarian works. The remarkable resonance it enjoyed in specialist and popular publication until the early 20th century make it, makes it one of the most influential and controversial sources in the history of Roman Bath studies. In exploring the reason behind the depiction enduring and critical acceptance, I will try to disentangle the complex relationship between ancient monuments, written architectural sources, and the early modern illustrations. This will allow me to raise broader questions concerning the nature of intellectual networks in 18th century Europe. So the publishing history of our image that you see here uh, began in Venice in 1553, when it appeared among the five woodcuts illustrating the De Balnes, a collection of more than 70 classical medieval and nearly modern texts edited and published by Tommaso Giunti. The volume responded to an increasing interest in balneology among, among 16th century scholars. It included the Latin translation of famous Arabic and Greek authors such as Ibn Sina or Avicenna, Hippocrates and Galen. The last contribution to this anthology was a compendium of ancient treaties on bathing by the physician Giovanni Antonio Sicco. His essay was preceded by our image, titled Balneorum Apud Veteres Forma. So the shape of the bath among the ancients. In the dedication to the Venetian patrician Domenico Morosini, Sicco, Sicco explains that, quote, because in this short commentary we often had to mention the structure of the bath, their various rooms and other parts, we took care that a depiction of the ancient bath was drawn. For that, we made use of the diligence and expertise of Giovanni Antonio Rusconi, who's, who has accurately explored Roman and ancient buildings and has observed them in detail. So Rusconi was a Venetian architect and a hydraulic engineer. He was also a translator and illustrator of Vitruvius. By 1553, he had prepared about 300 woodcuts for a commentary of Vitruvius de Architectura. However, the volume was never published due to the appearance in 1556 of Daniele Barbaro's Di Dieci Libri dell'Architettura, illustrated by Palladio. Only 160 of Rusconi's woodcuts were included in the posthumous book dell'Architettura, which is shown here. This is the frontispiece. The, the book, however, does not include our image although Rusconi certainly created to illustrate Vitruvius' des description of the hot water system of the bath. So we're gonna have a look at Vitruvius, Vitruvius passage now. So he reads as follows. Three bronze tanks should be placed above the underfloor furnace, one for hot, another for warm, and a third for cold water. They should be located in such a way that the amount of hot water flowing from the worm into the hot tank will be replaced by an equal amount flowing from the cold into the warm tank. And the half cylinders of the bath should be heated by the same underfloor furnace. So as you can see, it's a very complex passage and this, this generated some confusion among early modern antiquarians and architects. Sheffield, the translator of the, the, the author of the English translation, translator, sorry, translation, renders the Latin term aenea with the words bronze tanks. The main meaning of aeneum, however, is bronze or copper vase or cauldron. And it was interpreted as such in the Renaissance. So when Fra Giocondo, depicted this Aenea in the first richly illustrated printed edition of Vitruvius' work, published in 1511, he followed the text literally and drew three vases of bronze that you can see very clearly in this image. And they are shown on three steps with the water flowing from one into the other. This erroneous reconstruction clearly influenced, influenced Rusconi, who had a copy of Fra Giocondo's book in his library. And in, uh, in Rusconi's woodcut, the three vases can be seen very clearly on the right of the image. And each of them is identified by an inscription. And you can see 
uh, the, the text reading Frigidarium, Tepidarium, and Caldarium, the largest one being the Frigidarium. You can see flames that are actually heating the vase called Caldarium. And, uh, and uh, similar flames are depicting burning in the hippocaust, which is labeled hippocaust in the image. So we have two heated rooms, the balneum and the concamerata sudatio on the left. So after discussing the hot water system, Vitruvius gives instruction about the construction of the hippocaust, saying that the tiles paving the ground under the floor of heated room should be inclined toward the, towards the furnace so that, quote, the flames will spread more easily under the suspended floor. While we now know that only hot air circulated under the hanging floors, so the, the, the hippocaust was the system that allowed the, the rooms to be heated underneath, through underneath uh, this underneath heating system, okay? And uh, only hot air was circulating, not fire. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the fact that the tribus used the word flamma in the text, meaning, meaning flames, misled Rusconi. And as you can see, the hippocaust is filled with this fire and flames that you can see in the image. So the, let's, now, let's now have a look at, sorry, sorry that was the, for the, the discussion about the flames. But let's now move to the room named Balneum. We see five men in and around a tub labeled labrum. So from the 15th century onward, antiquarians favor this term to identify large Roman tubs or basins of marble, often re reused to adorn churches and palaces in Rome and elsewhere. The characteristic lion's head and rings that decorate the side of the, of the tub were common elements in ancient models and return in other 16th century and later illustrations. Among these, the depiction of a balneum in Fabio Calvo Simulacrum, published in 1527, is particularly significant. Inside a rotunda-like building, we see an elderly man and a boy immersed in a labrum decorated by two lion's head holding rings in their mouth. So the next name, the next, the, so the name of the next room in Rusconi Sprint, Concamerata Sudatio or Vaulted Sweating Room, is taken from another passage of Vitruvius about the structure of the palestra, so the, 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 the gymnasium in, in, in the Greek word. According to Vitruvius, the Concamerata Sudatio seems to be a separate room from the Laconicum, which was a, a circular dry steam sweat chamber. However, Rusconi draws the Laconicum as a small dome space in the left corner of the Concamerata Sudazzi. And you can see it here, I like it. So that the a room becomes that weird thing on the left of the, of the room. Inside this space, inside this, 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 uh, this room, we see this, this brazier covered by a clipeum. So, Again, we need to go back to Vitruvius' text to understand what's going on here. Uh, Rusconi misunderstood Vitruvius' description because we read in Vitruvius that an, an aperture should be left in the center of the hemispherical dome of the Laconicum with a bronze disc, clipeum neum, suspended from it on a chain by which the temperature of the sweating room can be adjusted by raising and lowering the heat. So instead of having, a, uh, as we will see later on, a, a hole on, in the ceiling of the room with this clipium that was used to let some fresh air coming in and out of the room, he created this weird arrangement that it was just out of his own uh, imagination. So a doom room became a doom brazier. And as you can see, there is a, a chain here that we allow to activate is brazier. Like the bathers in the balneum, these figures have their hair wrapped in turbans, a typical element in medieval and early modern bathing scenes. The other three rooms of the complex are labeled Tepidarium, Frigidarium, and Eleotesium. Two figures are getting undressed in the Tepidarium that were indeed used as changing rooms in antiquity. Very little is visible of the Frigidarium, there's a door, nothing more. 
And in the Leothesium, the oily room, we see five rows of shelves occupied by vases of different sizes, presumably full of oil. Suspended uh, over the bath, Rusconi depicted a strigil, strigilis in the text, so the ancient tool for scraping off dirt and oil from the body before bathing, which matches those in the, in the bathing scene of Calvo's simulacrum that we've seen before. Despite Sitko's claim that Rusconi had both accurately explored and uh, explored Roman and ancient buildings, the architect never spent time in Rome. So his knowledge of antiquity was mainly based on ancient texts and modern reconstruction like those by Fra Giocondo and Fabio Calvo that we mentioned already. Francesco Di Giorgio Martini and Giuliano da San Gallo are other two authors that might have influenced Rusconi. In the first version of his Trattato dating to the late 70s, early 80s of the 15th century, Francesco Di Giorgio produced a detailed reconstruction of the Vitruvian path that you can see reproduced here on the slide. It's a very interesting, fascinating um, work. And uh, the arrangement of the laconic room, so the, the, the sweat heating room, uh, hot room, sorry, depicted here presents similarities with the one seen in Rusconi's illustration. Yet instead of a dome brazier, we have a central cylindrical shaft rising to the ceiling of the room. On the other hand, the Aenea are more accurately represented as tents and identified with the term caldaie, which in Italian means boilers. And you can see them in the, um, in the square on the, in the red square on the right. Giuliano da Sangallo, they depicted this, the so-called Terme del Bacucco near Viterbo. And this drawing dates to the early 16th century. And again, this might have influenced Calvo's rotunda-like building and the arrangement of Rusconi's Concamerata Sudatio. So despite never being republished, the De Balnes was very successful and Rusconi's Vitruvian bath had some influence on contemporary artists. For instance, in the bathing scene designed by Piero Ligorio for the second edition of uh, Girolamo Mercuriale, Mercuriale's De Arte Gymnastica, we see several figures uh, in a large tub decorated by two lion's head and labeled Lavacrum Oceanum Bellabrum. This seems to be an elaborate version of Calvo and Rusconi's models, recalled also by the set of strigils in the upper left corner of the image. In the short term, however, Rusconi's woodcut was overshadowed by Palladio's illustration for the 1567 editions of Barbaro's translation and commentary to be true. Despite a few inaccuracies, Palladio's plan and section of the bath are indeed of exceptional quality and reflect his first-hand knowledge of the archaeological remains in Rome. So in the section view, Fra Giocondo's three bases are once again depicted uh, on the right side of the complex. And for some reason, the hippocaust extends also under the frigidarium, which is identified with the letter G. So the frigidarium is the cold room, there shouldn't be hippocaust there. On the other hand, the laconicum, which is called E, it identified with the letter E, is accurately rendered with its oculus, so this pole in the ceiling, and the bronze disc identified with the letter D. Moreover, the fire burns only in the furnace and not underneath the floor. Together with Fra Giocondo's thesis, Palladio's illustration remain a point of reference for the annotators of Vitruvius during the late 16th and 17th centuries. However, the impact and significance of Rusconi's woodcut changed dramatically at the turn of the 18th century. In 1704, Domenico de Rossi and Paolo Alessandro Maffei published the Raccolta di Statue Antiche e Moderne, a lavish illustrated compendium of 161 ancient and early modern statues from Rome. Rusconi's bath were reproduced at the beginning of the book over the description of the Laocon group. The image does not have a caption, but later in the book, Maffei described it as, quote, a wall painting of the well-known Bath of Titus from the books of drawings of the famous Museo Cartaceo 
of the Commendatore Cassiano dal Pozzo. Maffei adds that the alleged wall painting was, quote, discovered among the ruins of the Bath of Titus and later copied in a small drawing by someone working for Dal Pozzo. After praising the immense structures of the Termae and stressing the difficulty of their interpretation, Maffei presents the copy of the wall painting as the ultimate solution to all doubts of the antiquarians. He is delighted by how closely it matches the description of ancient authors, especially Vitruvius. So with a sudden plot twist, a 16th century woodcut became a copy of an ancient wall painting. Its authenticity backed up by the involvement of this guy, uh, Cassiano del Pozzo, one of the most authoritative antiquarians of the 17th century. His famous Museo Cartaccio or paper museum was a visual encyclopedia of antiquarian and scientific knowledge, an enormous collection of watercolors, drawings, and prints arranged into several volumes. More than 7,000 7, items survive today, divided between the British Library, the Royal Library at Windsor Castle, and other institutions around the world. The illustration reproduced in the raccolta is not part of the known Dal Pozzo corpus, but hundreds of drawings were lost after the dispersion of the collection in the mid 18th century. We know that Dal Pozzo collected 16th century Italian drawings, including records of Roman wall paintings. Some of these wall paintings came from the so-called Bath of Titus, a toponym used by antiquarians to indicate the area of the Bath of Trajan, or alternatively, the subterranean, subterranean rooms of the Domus Aurea, on top of which the Bath of Trajan had been built. However, it is unlikely that our image was originally included in the collection as part of this category. When, when copies were made from the 16th century antiquarian drawings, Balpozzo took care that the images were separated from their company inscriptions, while in our case, as you can see, the text was not removed. If the cutaway view of the bath was ever part of the Pozzo collection, this detail suggests that Dal Pozzo himself was aware that this was a reconstruction, not a wall painting. In any case, there is no way to ascertain the veracity of Maffei's account. The possibility that he intentionally rebranded Rescone's woodcut as, as a Roman wall painting and used it and used Dal Pozzo authority to underpin his authenticity cannot be entirely ruled out. Well, there is a detail that we're going to look at in a moment that might actually point to uh, the fact that um, that Maffei was in good faith. So the etching appearing in the book, in Maffei's book, was made by Francesco Faraonio Aquila, one of the main collaborators of the printing house owned by the Ross, the Rossi, which actually printed the book. Okay. Compared with Rusconi's woodcut, this illustration that you see on top. No, sorry, at the bottom. The, on top, you see the, the original one published in the Devalnes, at the bottom, the one that appeared in 1704, okay? So compared with Rusconi's woodcut, this illustration show a few modifications. The posture of some of the figures is different. The vases in the Eleotesium are different as well, and the position of the description. But the most striking difference is the omission of the nozzle dispensing water from the Calidarium vase into the labrum. So there is no connection. So the, the water cannot get into the, 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 the pool, basically. In, in, in his discussion of the image, Maffei quotes Seneca's natural questiones, so, so, so natural questions, I don't know in English, <laughs> and explained that conduits called dracones were used to distribute the hot water from the caldarium base to the bathtubs. So, the nozzle will have supported this detail, suggesting an unintentional alteration of the image. This inconsistency might point towards the existence of the small drawing from the, from the Dal Pozzo collection, and perhaps, as I say, imply the good faith of Maffei. Because were he in possession of, its, of, of the original, it is likely that he will have had Rusconi illustration reproduced as accurately as possible, especially regarding the nozzle that will have helped him in his discussion, okay? 
because all of this you know is discussed in the uh, in, in the description of the image in in the 1704 book so In 1707, a review praising the erudition of the Raccolta, my uh, Facebook, appeared in one of the most prestigious academic journals of the time, the Acta Eruditorum. The category view of the bath clearly caught the attention of the reviewer of the more than 160 illustrations in the Raccolta. It is the only one reproduced in the journal. After reporting the story of its origin and rediscovery, the reviewer explained that it was included because of its significance and because, quote, it cannot be easily found elsewhere. About a decade after this review, Rusconi's illustration appeared in the influential L'Antiquité Expliquée et Représentée en Figure by Bernard de Montfaucon. He presented as a very famous antiquary of the 18th century. He presented the, the, the painting as a copy of a Roman wall painting from the Bath of Titus and describe it in detail. The Mofocon was particularly interested in the laconic view because its function was disputed at the time, with some scholar considering just another name for the tepidarium. He notes that if the inscription identifying the room in the copy were already in the original wall painting, the issue was solved. The laconicum was, quote, a kind of stove. Perhaps with a hint of irony, he also comments that the many vases in the Eleothesium make it look like the shop of a pharmacist. The more than 30,000 illustration included in L'Antiquité Expliqué made, made it a formidable source for scholars. The book was soon translated into English and German, republished many times, and there was an expanded edition in 1724. As Stephanie Moser has demonstrated, the Mofocon was very aware of the central role played by images, which he called histoire muette, so the mute histories. He advised his, the readers not to rush through the pages of his work and encouraged them to take enough time to appreciate the illustration that he considered essential, an essential complement to the text. This is reinforced elsewhere in the book where the Mofocon notes that when illustrations are copied from life, they, they produce the same effect of seeing the depicted object on sight. Ironically, he also criticized those that had produced images, images based exclusively on the account of ancient author, which is exactly what Rusconi had done with this reconstruction. So this reveals just how insidious the second life of this depiction is. As a 16th century drawing, it was just another guesswork based on ancient text. As a copy of a, of a Roman wall painting, it acquired the auctoritas of the painting itself. So the success of L'Antiquité gave an exceptional visibility to our image, which from now on will appear in four broad categories of work, antiquarian treaties, description of Roman world paintings, architectural texts, and Vitruvian commentaries. These categories were extremely permeable. Scholars writing in different languages and with different agendas share a preoccupation with the complexity of Roman Bath. As noted by Maffei, the ruinous state of these buildings, the scant information provided by ancient sources, and the lack of Roman medals depicting Bath created confusion and disagreement among scholars. Vitruvius was exceptional among classical authors in dedicating an entire section of his treatise to the bath, yet the obscurity of some critical passages frustrated the expectation of early modern readers. The wall painting from the Bath of Titus was the reliable source the scholars had been waiting for. I'll now show you just a few of the many reincarnations of our image during the 18th and the 19th century. Berardo Galliani was the first annotator of Vitruvius to mention the alleged Roman wall painting in his discussion of the, on the bath. Remarkably, Galliani was critical of the way the three vases were rendered in the picture. According to him, quote, either the ancient painter set them in this way out of his own whim so that he could better show the water passing from one into the other, or more likely, 
this arrangement was typical only of the baffled Titus. And then the author Galliani provides his personal reconstruction of the Aenea, like you can see here. No, sorry. Well, it's this one on the right. Uh, so that you can see the three vases set on the same level and linked by a pipe at the bottom. The cutaway, cutaway view of the bath is among the 128 illustrations that embellish the antiquarian treatise Le, Le Plus Beau Monument de Romancienne, published in 1761 by the French painter and actor Jean Barbeau. Barbeau's version is an accurate copy of Aquila's etching, except for a startling difference. To the right of the Fregidarium vase, we can see two other vases and an entirely new room. The caption identify with the second order of bath for women. And as far as I'm aware, this is the only reproduction with this addition, and it was undoubtedly introduced by Barbeau. In his discussion of the Bath of Diocletian, Barbeau explained that the wall painting does not include the women's section of the bath, but it, but it clearly implies his existence. So this somehow justified his decision to have the engraver Joseph Bouchard incorporated into the image. Moving to England, in 1772, the Scottish architect Charles Cameron, Charles Cameron published The Bath of the Romans, explained and illustrated with texts in English and French. This volume was extremely successful and reissued in 1774 and 1775. As the author states in the introduction, it was based on Palladio's unfinished work on the Bath of Rome. And in the chapter, chapter Apartments Belonging to the Bath, Cameron discussed the hot water system and the hippocaust, noting that, quote, the particular position of the vessels alluded to by Vitruvius had been nearly ascertained by an antique painting found in the Bath of Titus. And then you have a, a simplified rendition of the painting uh, inserted at the beginning of the following chapter, and you can see up in the screen, on the screen now. The influence of the wall painting is evident in the way Cameron depicts a laconicum at Pompeii, where a fire, again, is shown in the hippocaust where it shouldn't be. The caption to this image doesn't mention the precise location of this room, but I was able to identify with the laconicum of the Casa di Giuseppe II. This, this house was excavated between 1767 and 1769, and it seems to be the first, this seems to be the first plan and section of this room ever to be published. By 1776, our image had become so popular that Giuseppe Carletti did not reproduce it in Le Antiche Camere delle Terme di Tito e le loro pitture, which is the ancient chambers of the Bath of Titus and their paintings. In fact, he claims that the image was, quote, su sufficiently known to the scholars. Carletti was the first author to associate the alleged wall painting with the Laotone group. He states that the painting and the sculpture were discovered in the same room at the beginning of the 16th century. And the fact that in the raccolta, the illustration, which you can see here, was reproduced over the, the description of the Laocon group, probably triggered this association, further enhancing the prestige of the picture. During the first half of the 19th century, the image continued to be used to illustrate the functioning of Roman art. <laughs> especially by annotators of Vitruvius. At the same time, it started to be widely employed in educational and encyclopedic works, such as the Penny Encyclopedia and Chambers Encyclopedia. The quality of the reproduction vary. Some are extremely simplified or adapted to the new taste, like the one that you can see here. This is an intriguing reinterpretation of our image by Carlo Bonucci an early 19th century Italian architect who published an illustrated description of Pompeii in 1827. So Bonucci merged the interior of the female section of the forum bath in Pompeii, which is accurately rendered, with our image. And you can actually see on the right, the three vases, which appear somehow inconsistent with the rest of the reconstruction, right? And this is a striking example of the impact that the alleged wall painting had on the archeological imagination 
and antiquarian, uh, of architects and antiquarians alike. Finally, in the late 19th century, the French historian Victor Avro published a revised and expanded edition of his Histoire de Romaine, originally published in 1843. Our image appears in the section of the book dedicated to the Roman house, but in a footnote, the author describes the image as, quote, a restoration made during the Renaissance at the order of an architect as a theoretical depiction of ancient Bath. So the image was finally identified as an early modern work. As a result, the wall painting completely disappeared from later scholarly texts. However, its effectiveness in illustrating ancient Bath was such that it continued to be used in encyclopedic work until the early 20th century, including the 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So after its first reappearance in the Rossi and Maffei Raccolta, published in 1704, our image was discussed reproduced, or at least mentioned in all the major 18th century studies of Roman Bath. By tracing references to previous author, authors, it is possible to plot the intricate network of influences that characterized antiquarian writing at the time. As you can see from this chart, the Mofocon Antiquité Expliqué and Galliani's commentary on Vitruvius were the two key works in the dissemination of this illustration followed by Cameron's The Bath of the Romans and the Raccolta itself. So this is the starting point. And this is the alleged uh, paper museum uh, drawing that we don't really know if he was there or not. Um, so coming to wrapping up, um, some of the authors were unconvinced by certain details of the image, as we have seen, but no one ever doubt the image authenticity. So the authorities of names such as Cassian del Pozzo, Maffei, de Mufocon was simply unquestioned. Furthermore, the more the image was reproduced, the more it earned credibility. Its effectiveness in explaining complex aspects of Roman Bath quickly, quickly raised it to the rank of a standard reference. The sheer visual nature of the world painting made it even more convincing than ancient texts. That Shudi has recently stressed the role that prints had in forming visual culture among early modern scholars. He notes that, quote, prints reverse the accustomed relationship between the model and the copy in the sense that it is suddenly the medium that makes reality real. The iconicity of certain illustration was such that all prints were considered as reliable as the physical remains of antiquity themselves making this reproduction, quote, no less legitimate than republish, republish ancient literature. As we have seen, the Mofo console images as mute histories. He believed that if the illustration of an object was drawn from life, it, it had almost the capacity to transport the viewer in front of the real object on site. The Mofocon compares the revealing capacity of the image to the experience of a traveler that finally gets the chance to visit the city that has been described to him many times. In fact, quote, the traveler finds everything new when he sees with his own eyes. Rusconi's illustration gave scholars the possibility to see the elusive Vitruvian bath with their own eyes. It's a, it, the success of this image is revealing, as well as being part of what Lucy Pelz calls a community of the text. 18th century scholars form a community of the image where illustration play a crucial role in the construction of antiquarian knowledge. At a time when traveling remained costly and a, a costly and complex business, the sheer existence of the community depended on the circulation of images. Eckhart Lescher has challenged the concept of image transfer traditionally employed by art historian to describe the role of illustrated books and engravings in disseminating visual culture. Alternatively, he suggests the term migration, which implies the active agency of a work of art within a favorable social and cultural milieu. So the migration of the alleged wall painting from one text to another testified just how, how authoritative this agency will become. Scholars were so dependent on the printed image in their attempts to engage with antiquity that they preferred to question 
the reliability of the ancient author of the wall painting than the fidelity of the engraver or the authenticity of its model. A lack of trust in latter could potentially delegitimize an entire system of knowledge construction and dissemination. Romanists were exposed to the visual conditioning of, wall, of the so-called wall painting <coughs> for almost two centuries, and this inevitably shaped their perception of ancient Bath. This prevented them from critically reappraising the work of their pre predecessors, transforming the often erroneous interpretation of a 16th century antiquarian into a paradigm. So this paper tried to use the long lasting and widespread impact of Rusconi's illustration as a tool to reconstruct the evolution of Roman bath studies. This allowed me to shed some light on the complexity of scholarly networks during the long 18th century, revealing the role of images in the creation and the dissemination of antiquarian knowledge. Thank you. I'm going to show so uh, when anyone raises the hand, I'm going to tell you because I have a seat. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I asked you to kindly moderate the discussion. Of course. Yes, sure. <laughs> um, and uh, I hope that uh, I can, uh, I will be heard clearly uh, by uh, everyone online. Uh, I'm probably going to start with the first question, if you don't mind. Uh, there are several very interesting points that I would like to comment on. Some of them are tiny little details, which perhaps we are going to discuss later. Uh, but uh, there is a general comment I have, uh, and I would like to hear from you what you think about this. There is this, there is this authority of visual art you were talking about. Uh, which somehow causes this uh, uh, 16th century depiction, the 16th century render of, of uh, original concept being uh, kind of being imbued with this power of, of visual language that is then accepted as uh, undisputed, right? Uh, do you think that this process is a Affected by the way how sense of sight changes in the 17th century with things like uh, introduction of microscopes and uh, other visual instruments which, uh, which expand the world. So, so what I want to say is sight is changing throughout mm -hmm. the 17th century. Do you think that this change somehow affects also this understanding of pictures and their authority? Yeah, that's a really good question. I never thought about it in this way. I mean, it's definitely, it, it probably affected the uh, kind of relationship that scholars had with images because the possibility to access these new words, you know, the, the very small and the very large, that uh, was debuted, would, was debated at length in the in the 17th century, it was by someone seen as something very negative, something that was going against God's will. And um, by other instead, it was seen as a fantastic improvement that finally allow us to actually understand better the marvels of the world. So I guess there, that in a sense, you know, this this capacity to see better might have announced the desire of, of these antiquarians to actually visually uh, um, perceive the past. And, uh, and so the, 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 this image that was, as I say, you know, it was made in the 16th century, but then as a reconstruction, and then it was completely changed because it was presented as, a, as, a, as an original wall painting that was uh, clearly will have changed completely the understanding of the buildings. It might have been it might have been particularly attractive to the readers of the 18th century 
thanks to this, um, to the fact that they got used to, to perceive visuality as something essential in the process of knowledge creation. Thank you. That's, uh, I, if, I, if I can have a follow up. Yeah, sure. Because this, the, there is one thing that surprises me. There was this spigot which disappeared, leaving the hot water to, to, the, to that central room. And this is this is technical detail. So I would expect that this wouldn't disappear. That this would be kind of intense. This would be discussed and and uh, somehow uh, you know they had to ask where does the water come from and how what, what is the purpose of, of this of, in terms of technical realization. And clearly they either didn't or so so. so, so <laughs> It looks to me as if that uh, if that uh, change of side was unable to somehow start this this technical or help this technical perspective. Absolutely. I mean that 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 I was extremely surprised too when I realized that that bit was missing because it was clearly an essential part of the of the structure. Okay, it was allowing the water to flow from the from the heating system to the to the, to the pool, so to the to the tub. So it's a, it's a, that's why I think that something happened there, something that is not very, it's not possible to reconstruct fully. So uh, there might have been this image at some point may have been in the collection of the pozzo. It might have been drawn in a different way. There might have been some differences, and then somehow ended up being uh, labeled as a as a wall painting. And so that's why I think that actually Maffei is quite. Uh, honest when he talks about it. It doesn't really, it seems to me that he made this up because otherwise, as you say, he would have actually made sure to, 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 to be, for the drawing to be as accurate as possible so that it would have been clear that the water was passing through the vases into the, into the tap. So there must have been a mistake at some point, but not, I don't think that Maffei was aware of that. So I, don't, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, usurp you. Uh, if anyone else has a question, then please raise your hand uh, via Zoom or. Uh, uh, so you have experience with visual as well as textual depiction. My question is, when you see this uh, loose, uh, this uh, shift of meaning in, in visual art, the same thing must happen also in textual depictions of these technical uh, instruments. And do you think uh, that text is better or worse to convey this kind of meaning? Because uh, I, as a historian of medicine who works mostly with texts uh, this thing disappearance of tiny little detail that changes substantially the meaning of the whole thing uh, it, it, if it happens in text you know, <laughs> then you're done absolutely yeah so I think it, in a sense having the images um, so I think that there is a sense that you know the, the the kind of accuracy expected by text was not always there when you know we were dealing with images. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's it's an ongoing process, and many of these scholars actually were very keen to have very accurate renditions. But there was also a very practical issue there that you know they had to go through artists, and so. Some of these scholars actually learn to draw themselves because they want to not, they didn't want to have anybody between the object and and the and themselves. But most of them would, would have not be able to actually create an image, so they rely on someone else. And this process obviously added someone else to the chain of knowledge and could cause some very critical mistakes. And uh, and this is the case. Uh, I mean, there are cases in, in England, for instance, during the uh, late uh, 17th century. Um, I mean, there, there are several occasions when members of the Royal Societies 
complains about the fact that there is, you know, this problem of having someone making the drawings for them, which is probably, again, not quite, uh, it's not working well in the final uh, outcome because it's not uh, accurate. And, uh, and so I guess the whole process of engaging with reality through images was further complicated by this, the presence of the artist. That was uh, somehow difficult to uh, control by the scholars. Which leads me to another question. Do you think that additions or detractions could be a result of simple availability of space on the page? Uh, when the artist was rendering something, uh, and as kind of illustration or, or an, another uh, sub question or or sub note of mine, there is very in, visually very interesting print from the beginning of the 16th century, uh, which is called uh, Die Grosse und Arznei by Hieronymus Brunsch. And there are a lot of beautiful woodcuts depicting topics from surgery and other related themes. And if you go through these woodcuts and pay attention, you realize that they are actually, uh, the, these woodcuts are created from two halves. They are like square, they have square shape, mm -hmm. but uh, this square shape is composed of two halves. Okay. And these halves appear repeatedly combined together in several, in, in different combinations in several of these woodcuts. So they were recycling contents, yeah. which that, that's something that changes. It's obviously done for financial reasons uh, and for practical reasons. So I'm asking about this, this practi practicality, practical point of view, how much this affected visual art and its technical ability to, to be precise in terms of technical right. it, it definitely play a crucial role. We have seen, for instance, in the reconstruction, uh, in, um, the illustration um, of uh, um, the Roman bath explained and illustrated by um, Scott. In that, in, that, in that book, the, the image, our image, is extremely simplified. So, and the, the, the only reason why it's so simplified because it was very small. I cannot really go back now, but it was just at the top of, of the, uh, at the beginning of a chapter. So it was a very small uh, uh, illustration. And so the artist was forced to be very synthetic in his rendition, okay? And so clearly there is an element of how large the illustration is, how much space we have, and, and uh, also, how much importance we want the illustration to have in the uh, in the page, and uh, so I think definitely all these technical aspects were extremely relevant in the process of knowledge creation and, and, and exchange. They seem trivial, but they actually affected the quality, the the efficiency. The, sorry, the, the the quality was let's say of the image and the, and the, the capacity of the image to transmit knowledge. Can I ask you, the, yeah. the original image, what was the origins of it? Was it an interpretation, purely interpretation of text, a yes. description, or was there any personal visual uh, uh, visiting on the site where they could then have their visualization? Yeah. I, I, I asked myself the same question when I was working on this. And uh, so we don't know much about Rusconi's life, but we do know that he never went to Rome. I mean, this doesn't mean that he might have not seen a Roman bathhouse, the ruins of the Roman bathhouse somewhere else. But it seems very likely that he actually got the whole thing exclusively from text, so Vitruvius, maybe, and previous images. So the one that I show you, you know, uh, see the, 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 the paintings, or sorry, the prints that were published before the publication of this image also kind of try to uh, put together visually something that was known almost exclusively from text. So uh, this doesn't mean that, that Antiparians didn't have some knowledge of the Roman bath in Rome. And we do know that they did because we have texts like the Roman Instaurata by Biondo, which actually described the bath of Rome in the mid 16th, in, in the mid 15th century. So they did have an engagement, direct engagement with the ruins, but 
the understanding of the practicalities, like you know, these details of how they could actually heat the water and how the hippocamps work, that was completely lost to them. And so they were that was based exclusively on the text. All right, do we have questions from uh, online audience? It doesn't seem so. Uh, so as this embodied voice, I would probably uh, <laughs> conclude this uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming here and talking about Roman Bath. It was very engaging. Uh, and uh, we'll meet again uh, next year uh, uh, with another uh, lecture from History of Medicine. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.